Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So let me start by uh, congratulating the organizers for this uh, bravery of organizing a conference these days. I, I'm really grateful for finally coming back to a conference and uh, with real people. So, um, so today I, I'm going to tell you about this, uh, where is string theory? So that's the provocative title. The, the real title is S matrix bootstrap for effective field theories. So uh, as probably many of you know, we've been uh, trying to develop this uh, S matrix bootstrap approach um, in parallel with the conformal bootstrap. And uh, in particular today, I want to talk about the application to effective field theory. So to theories uh, with massless particles. And I give you here a list of um, different types of systems that we have studied or are in the process of studying. But today, well, also for simplicity and for a uh, uh, question of time, I will focus on this application to uh, 10 dimensional supergravity, which uh, was work done with Andrea Guerrieri and Pedro Vieira. Okay. Um, so the outline of the talk, it's uh, very simple. I will give you some brief general introduction to this idea of the S matrix bootstrap. And then I will talk about the specific supergravity uh, 2 to 2 scattering. And in that context, I will review this general numerical approach to the S matrix bootstrap. Okay. And we'll finish with some discussion. So, so what's the general story? Well, the general story is this uh, bootstrap philosophy that we want to do things non-perturbatively. So we want to work with finite uh, physical observables and just constrain them by uh, consistency conditions. Okay? So, uh, in particular, so the, the conformal bootstrap is, is well known. So we, it has been successful, very successful over the past decade. And now we're to trying to understand is how can we generalize this kind of methods, at least the idea, to the full RG flow. Okay? So for quantum field theories that have mass scales, so you can think of them as an RG flow between two CFTs. So this is the, the big question. And uh, then you can focus on some specific examples where in the IR, you have a free CFT, for example, a set of Goldson bosons. And, uh, and then you just want to bound not the full uh, quantum field theory, but let's say uh, the behavior near the IR that can be described by an effective field theory with uh, irrelevant couplings. Um, higher derivative couplings for this uh, massless particle, say photons or Goldstone bosons. Okay, so, so the, the strategy is that uh, we want to really build up on the success of the conformal bootstrap and transfer the techniques to this new problem. So, so that analogy becomes more precise uh, in this table. So in the conformal bootstrap, the, what worked was to look at four point correlation functions and impose uh, unitarity together with crossing symmetry. Okay, so this is the t-shirt equation that uh, you, you've seen uh, many times. So the question is, what was the analog of that in a massive theory? And at first you could think that, well, I can just keep the same observable, right? A four point function of local operators is well defined in conformal field theory, but it's also well defined in quantum field theory. So why don't I just study now the same observable in this new setting of uh, quantum field theory? And that might work, but it's just too complicated, at least for me, because the degree of complexity really jumps. So in conformal field theory, a four point function is a function of two variables, only two cross ratios, while in quantum field theory, it becomes a function of six variables, right? There's six independent distances between four points. So, I mean, functions of six variables are too hard for me. So the 
from the technical point of view, what you can do is not to study four point functions of local operators, but to study scattering amplitude. And then if you look at the two to two scattering amplitude, now you have the same kind of complexity of a function of two variables, right? the, the energy, the center of mass energy and the scattering angle. So, so that's a good map in terms of uh, complexity. And we also know how to impose uh, unitarity and uh, crossing on scattering amplitude. So the equations also map uh, in a good analogy. And of course, I'm not uh, the first one to think about this. This was before I was born very popular. And, uh, and I guess our goal here is to revisit these old ideas with new insights from the bootstrap and also uh, some stronger numerical methods that were not available at the time. Okay, so this is the general story. But today I want to talk about gravity. Okay, so gravity is a bit different from this picture, it's not a quantum field theory. So gravity for me is just, or if you want quantum gravity, is just some UV completion of general relativity. And so what we know is just the IR. We know that in the IR, we have massless gravitons, which then, um, are, which are weakly coupled. And then as you increase energy, we can parameterize our ignorance by higher derivative terms in the effective field theory. And well, nobody really knows where it comes from. It might come from string theory, UV completion or something else. And the question I want to address today is, if we just impose this reasonable set of uh, properties on the two to two scattering amplitude of gravitons, uh, what kind of constraints can we get on the effective field theory coupling? Okay? Is everything allowed or, or not? And of course, I'm going to do this in the context of uh, supergravity. Uh, so yeah, I know that in this setup, it's not so easy to ask questions in, in real time, but I really encourage you to, to do that. I, I can even write to answer you in real time. So please, please do ask questions if you, if you don't understand anything. Thank you, very good. I mean, there are, uh, there has been a lot of activity in uh, trying to, um, to see if the gravity has a ultraviolet completion in sort of some uh, asymptotic safeness scenario and so on. Do you think that your method uh, could help in this uh, direction that are many people are working on this, uh, on this project? So it seems natural to fit uh, in this setup. It's a, it's a very good question. So I, I, I would expect that uh, if you have some other UV completion, well, we can ask the specialists in this approach, but I think they would expect all these properties to still hold for the scattering amplitude. So, so I, I would, my answer would be yes. Then perhaps a more interesting answer is if they can give you some extra input, say for the high energy behavior from short distances that we could also try to use here. Although even in the quantum field theory setup, well, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but okay. Thanks for the question. Um, so we also study pions, okay? And pions, we know the UV, right? We know it's QCD and we can compute. But in our S-matrix bootstrap approach, it's very difficult to put information about the UV fixed point on the scattering amplitude of pions. Because what QCD tells you about pion scattering is, something like, for example, hard scattering, fixed angle, high energy, but that's something very difficult for us to impose in the numerics. But in principle, if we improve our methods, it could be useful. And if they know something like that from us, uh, we could try to pinpoint that in the, in the setup. But thanks for the question. Any other question? Excellent. So now I'll... So anyhow, yeah, also asymptotic safety theory will be maybe embedded in some string theory. The point is, uh, can, can you say which string theory can, can is your method useful to, to understand? 
something about uh, vacua or string theory, moduli, and so on. Um, well, I well maybe maybe you can ask again at the end once I show you what kind of things we can do. But uh, yeah, we will get some scattering amplitudes so you can analyze the scattering amp, what are the resonances, what are the phase shifts, and try to understand what kind of string theory uh, could give rise to that. But you, please ask again if, if it's not clear from the... Okay, so let's, uh, let's now specialize to this uh, problem that I want to study. So we will uh, focus on maximal supergravity in 10 dimensions. And as I said, we will focus on this observable of two to two scattering because this is the right complexity for uh, bootstrapping purposes. And uh, well, the great advantage of working with the, in this supersymmetric setup is that all the complications of uh, spin of helicity of the graviton uh, uh, trivialize because you can do two to two scattering of the full supergraviton multiplet in terms of this simple formula where all the complexities related to the different uh, components of the multiplet, different helicities are in the prefactor, which is something completely fixed by supersymmetry. And then the only dynamical information is encoded in a single scalar function of the Mandelstam invariance, ST and U, uh, and of course, since these are massive par massless particles, S plus T plus U sums to zero. So only two of them are independent. Okay. So the function, the observable we want to understand is this function A of S, T and U, a single scalar function of, uh, of uh, two independent variables. Um, so what do we know about this function? Well, as I explained before, we know the low energy because we can use supergravity to compute this function at low energies. And then we can use higher derivative corrections to compute corrections, higher uh, the low energy expansion of this function. So I, I show you here uh, what you get from supergravity. So that's, uh, that's this, this equation here. And at the same time, I'm defining this amplitude T, which is just S to the four times A. This T is a particular, particularly useful component within this super multiplet. You can think of it as the axid dilaton uh, scalar in type 2B. So it's, it's a scattering amplitude of charged scalars. So the only two uh, diagrams are these because these scalars are charged. There's no S channel graviton exchange. And that's why you get these two poles, S square over T and S square over U. And that's the supergravity resolve. And, uh, and then the next term is this uh, constant alpha. Okay? So this is the first, so you see this is, uh, well, I, I guess it's better if I show you it here directly. It's uh, uh, first Wilson coefficient that appears in this amplitude and it corresponds to an R to the four higher derivative correction in the effective action. Okay. So here maybe I can explain something uh, in real time. So, so you, you probably should complain because I told you, um, well, actually this I wrote, but I didn't emphasize. So this, this function crossing symmetry is just permutation invariance of this function and the permutation of ST and U. Okay, so that's what crossing symmetry means for this function. So, so you see that the, the first term in, in A can be written just as one over STU, which is obviously crossing symmetric. And now we kind of jump many orders in the derivative expansion. So why you, you should have asked, why don't you have a term like one over ST plus one over SU plus one over uh, TU? This would be the next order in the derivative expansion after one over STU, and it would be crossing symmetric, right? So why isn't it there? Well, you can put it, but it's equal to zero under this constraint, okay? So that's why this term is not there. But then you can still complain and, and reasonably, you could also have one over S plus one over T plus one over U. 
that's also crossing symmetric and it's still before the constant. So this one um, cannot be there for the following reason. So if you had this term, you see this amplitude T. So this would imply that the amplitude T um, contains a term like S to the fourth over T, right? Because the amplitude T is just take this A, which is crossing symmetric and multiply by S to the fourth. And then you get the amplitude for charge scalars scattering. But now in this context, what would be the interpretation of this term? It's a pole at t equals zero. So it means it's a massless particle being exchanged, but the residue is S to the four. So it means the particle that's being exchanged has spin four. So this would imply there is a massless spin four particle in the theory, which is not true in supergravity. Okay? So this is uh, not allowed by, uh, by the spectral condition that you're just, you're recompleting uh, theory of massless spin two particles or spin two multiplets. Okay, so if you want, that's another way of rediscovering that the supersymmetry forbids any uh, correction before r to the four in 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 type in ten dimension. Okay, no questions. Very good. So so I just want to emphasize that the focus of this. Uh, talk is going to be this constant alpha. Okay, so this, this constant alpha is our ignorance about the first correction to uh, supergravity. It's the lowest uh, Wilson coefficient, lowest order Wilson coefficient in the effective field theory of supergravity. Yes, please. Exactly. So that's thank you for the question. That's the next slide. No needs for the in type two B string theory. Yes, exactly. So in string theory, we know this constant alpha. And uh, so in type 2b, it depends on the, um, on the complexified string coupling in terms of this uh, Eisenstein, uh, non-holomorphic Eisenstein series. And, uh, and we know it and we can plot it. And you discover something very interesting if you plot it. So here I plot it only over the fundamental domain because this function is modular invariant. So it's enough to plot it over the fundamental domain. You notice that this function is always greater than approximately 0 0.14. And this minimum value is attained here at the tip, at this cusp of the fundamental domain. Okay. Similarly, you can do the same in, in 2A. And in two ways, actually much simpler, the expression is elementary, but the same property holds. There is a minimum value for this alpha around 0 0.14. Yes. So, sorry, maybe you said it, but I, I miss it. Why there is no function of the dimensionless cross, the dimensional ratios like S over T or right. so, S over U? So, um, so these are Wilson coefficients, right? This, so these are just numbers. And then when you compute the amplitude, they will contribute to the amplitude as alpha times some function of the Wilson coefficients. In this case, for A, it's really just as a constant. It's just by, if you want by dimensional analysis. Uh, so maybe, maybe my formulas are not entirely clear, but this parenthesis here is this function capital A of ST and U. And it starts as one over STU, that's supergravity. And then you have an expansion now in the powers of ST and U. Yeah. And the next term, which is allowed, is a constant. Yeah, no, but S over T would be dimensionless, right? Ah. Um, sorry, I see what you mean. Um, Right, but but you okay? Then you're saying why it's not any function of uh, dimensionless ratios, right? But that's not how effective field theory works, right? When you when you do effective field theory, um, you have higher derivative terms, so ge they generate polynomial, uh, right? Because the effective field theory is polynomial in the field, so you when you expand around flat space you just get uh, polynomial scattering amplitudes, right? So here you do have this denominator 
1 over STU. But if you open it up, you see all the poles, all the non analytics have to be associated with exchanged particles, right? So, so the effective field theory diagrammatics, what will build for you is more vertices possible. For example, this R to the four will, will correspond to a quartic vertex, to a quartic vertex like that. But all the propagators are the propagates of supergravity. So you cannot get more complications than that. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's not just dimensional analysis, it's dimensional analysis plus the expected analytic structure coming from uh, effective field theory. Okay, so I was, I was here and I was uh, explaining this observation that in both type 2b and type 2a, the minimum value of alpha is about 0 0.14 but you can go all the way to infinity. It's, and the easiest way is just to go to weak coupling, okay? If you go to weak, uh, to small string coupling, alpha goes to infinity, okay? So the final thing I want to say is that uh, we know for sure that this alpha has to be positive, okay? And we know because alpha can be written as this uh, dispersive sum rule as an integral over the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude, which is positive by the optical theory. Okay, so here, in view of time, I'm not really explaining the, the contour argument you do to derive this sum rule, but it's a standard type of contour argument where you, you draw this big arc in the upper half plane and you, you, you derive this sum rule. And uh, let me just emphasize that this sum rule, so you could worry because there's a, S to the fifth here in the denominator, that it could be IR divergent, but it is not because the imaginary part of the amplitude can be computed, again, using the effective field theory. And of course, the imaginary part will come from a one loop diagram, the, the leading term in the imaginary part. And we, we have computed and we, it starts also as S to the fifth. So this integral is perfectly IR finite, but uh, it's definitely sufficient to show that alpha must be positive. So, so this is the state of affairs. Alpha in principle could be any real number. Now we know cannot be negative. Okay, so that's what we call the desert is really obviously excluded. Then we have the garden. So above 0 0.14 we know cannot be excluded because we have string theories that realize that. So that seems to be a good value. And then we have a little gap which we call the swamp. I don't know, some people say it's not the good name because swamps are, are very good things in, for the ecosystem, but okay. Um, where we don't know, could there be some UV completion of supergravity that realizes an alpha between zero and 0 0.14 or not? Okay. And so what we decided to do was to say, well, let's take our S matrix bootstrap machinery and ask if, just imposing unitarity um, analyticity and crossing symmetry for this amplitude would already put a bound on this alpha similar to that would exclude this one. Okay. We, we just asked what would it give? And okay, that's the next part of our of the talk. Okay. Any question about the setup? So I, I hope the question is clear. And now I will explain how we can approach this question using this S matrix structure. Okay, so this is a systematic algorithm by now. Well, at least the approach I will follow, then there are alternative approaches that are still being developed. But the algorithm that I'm proposing here, uh, yeah. It's really systematic and it's basically three steps. So the first step, we just write an ansatz for the amplitude. And the trick is that the, this ansatz will do most of the job, okay? We'll already obey all these properties. So Lorentz invariance is trivial. We will write it as a function of ST and U. Crossing symmetry is also trivial. We will make it symmetric. Analytics is slightly more non-trivial, but I will explain. 
And I should say here that we're going to impose uh, what's sometimes called maximal analysis or Mandelstam analysis. Okay, we're going to assume that the only non-analyticities that the amplitude has on on the first sheet on, of the S and T complex plane are the ones imposed by unitarity. That there is no extra. Uh, so this is more than what was been proven rigorously, even in quantum field theory. Of course, in gravity, basically, there is no real result because we don't know the theory of quantum gravity, so it's hard to prove rigorous results about its S matrix. Okay. So, but, but, um, yeah, just keep it in mind. So we're gonna explore the space of maximally analytic S matrix. And finally, we, our ansatz will also, by construction, match the low energy effective field theory. Okay, we'll only represent functions that have the same low energy expansion as I showed you before. So that part we can do exactly. And then step number two is harder because we need to impose unitarity. And the way we will do it is to decompose the two to two scattering out in partial waves. And, uh, and okay, we can write all the equations, but there's an infinite number of unitarity equations satisfied. So this will require some numerical implementation. And, uh, and once we have all those unitarity constraints, step number three, you can just choose whatever you want to minimize or maximize. Here, of course, we will minimize this constant alpha within this ansat subject to the constraint of unitarity. Okay, so this is the general algorithm. Now, before giving you equations, I want to give you a bit more of a refinement of the algorithm. So one very important point in this algorithm is, um, is the existence of some parameters. So when we write an ansatz, we write an ansatz with many free parameters, which will basically be of the order of n squared. So n will count the power of our ansatz. Okay? So we will make, an, if n is very large, we need a bigger computer and we will get a better ansatz to explore the space of S matrices. The same thing happens at unitarity. So at, to impose unitarity, we need to impose unitarity for every partial wave of spin L. But in the computer, we will introduce a cutoff. We will only impose unitarity up to some maximal L. Okay. So again, in the end, we will have to extrapolate both these parameters to infinity to get uh, good answers. Okay. So the first extrapolation means that we are really imposing all the constraints of unitarity for all spins. And the ex second extrapolation means that we are exploring uh, an ansatz that can uh, cover the, sp all the, sp the entire space of analytic functions. Think of it as like a, Taylor exp a truncated Taylor expansion. Basically, that's what it's gonna be. So if you want to explore functions which are analytic in a disk, you can write, powers of z to the up to z to the n, and then you make n go to infinity, and then you cover all functions that are analytic inside the disk. So basically that's what we're gonna do. Okay, now I will explain each step with equations for this particular case. And uh, yeah, again, please interrupt if something is not clear. Sorry, you have to be careful about the two now, but let's just be fair. You have to not test too many things relative to how many parameters you, you had, right? I, so the, the question is if I have to be careful, uh, I guess, with the order of limits and how, how L and then goes to infinity. Um, I think in principle, yes. So the way we will do it is we will first take N fixed and take L to infinity. So for each fixed N, we will try to impose all the constraints and we will see that we will still have a non-trivial minima. And then we will increase the size of n and, and see the connection. I will show you the plots, but we will do it in this order, L first and then after. Okay, so point number one is to write the ansatz. So here it is. So don't, okay. There is many, many technicalities here that are not important. So let me just explain the basic idea. So the basic idea is you have a function of ST and U with a constraint, S plus U plus U equals zero. First thing we do is we forget the constraint. Let's write a function of ST and U with three independent variables. 
So unitarity tells us that each variable should live on a cut plane where the cut goes from zero to infinity is just a production cut from, uh, because we have massless particles. So it starts immediately from S equals zero. So what we do is we do a conformal mapping of this cut plane to the disk. And then we just write Taylor series for a function on three disks on the product of three disks. Okay, so this, this variable rho s, so this is what we're doing here. Rho s to the power a, rho t to the power b, rho u to the power c, and then abc sum. Uh, and again, you see n capital N here is the truncation on this Taylor series. Okay. So <laughs> since the function was analytic in the cut disk, in the cut plane is analytic in the disk. So I can write a conversion Taylor series. Um, Okay, so of course, this part here, which is the supergravity result, would not be analytic. Um, so we write it uh, explicitly. Um, well, actually, it would still be analytic in this uh, disk. It would just put a pole here at s equals zero, but we write the pole separately, and then we add uh, the, this, uh, this Taylor series. And then uh, there are some details. Let me not explain all of them. The most important is that this prime, this prime just means that, um, means two things. One is that you want to impose uh, the low energy behavior. So we take this ansatz and we expand at small st and u and we match the effective field theory. So we, that puts some constraints on these free parameters, alpha ABC so that the low energy expansion really starts like the function I show you, okay? So it's some linear constraints. And there's also some technical advantage that uh, you can eliminate some, some monomials using this constraint, okay? So this constraint in terms of rho s, rho t, rho u becomes some polynomial constraint, which you can use to eliminate because of course, at in practice, we only want a function of two variables. So this extension is non-unique. So you can use that prism to reduce the, the numerical cost. Okay. But I think that that's about uh, what you want to know about this. If you want to know more, you can ask me after. So that's step number one. So then step number two is, uh, is unitarity constraints. And again, here, uh, supersymmetry is very helpful. So, this prefactor R that was uh, in the amplitude, this prefactor, I write it R to the fourth, but there's some, some specific uh, structure that has to do with the polar external polarizations, obeys this nice equation. Okay, so this was shown in this paper from 98. So this equation basically uh, descends or implies that the discontinuity of the scalar amplitude A is just the product of two amplitudes A integrated over the two particle phase space. And, uh, and actually the best way to think about it is that in terms of the amplitude T, that's why I define this amplitude T of two charged scalars, unitarity of the full two to two multiple amplitude is just S channel unitarity for this amplitude T, okay? So well, again, this is some details, but the message is the only thing you need to do is take this charge scalar scattering amplitude, decompose in S channel partial waves and impose unitarity for all spins. Okay. So that's easy to do. You take your scattering amplitude here, you integrate with Gegenbauer polynomials, you obtain your partial amplitude of spin L. Okay, so this, this SL is the amplitude for a two graviton state, well, two charge scalar state in a state of angular momentum L to scatter back into the same state of two particles, same angular momentum. Okay. So of course the probability is the square, the norm square, and that probability must be less than one. So for in, in particular, if you have particle production, you send two particles get more, that will decrease this probability, okay? And unitarity is just a statement. You have to impose this for all else. As I said, we have a cutoff. And then you have to impose this for all energies, S greater than zero. And what we do here numerically is that we put a dense grid. Okay, we put some grid starting from S equals zero going to infinity. And here, okay, in principle, 
there's another extrapolation in the density of the grid to be done, but somehow the numerics here works very well. So we, we just do a dense grid and then we try another one and basically nothing changes. So we are confident that this is not affecting the results. Okay, again, I think you don't want to know more about this. So let me tell you the results. So, so let me just emphasize that we wrote the ansatz and we have a lot of free parameters that enter linearly in the amplitude. And then let me show that equation again. I think it's useful to see it. So the free parameters enter linearly in the amplitude. These are this alpha ABC, which are symmetric tensor. And now the unitarity constraints are just quadratic because SL is linear in the amplitude. And then you just have a quadratic constraint on these parameters. So if you have uh, a set of quadratic constraints, this falls under the optimization problem called semi-definite programming. And so you can just now minimize this alpha, which is some linear combination of the parameters using, we use the code STPB developed by David Simons Duffin for the conformal bootstrap. So we can use exactly the same code because it's the same type of uh, optimization problem. Okay, and here are the results. So I'm plotting here the minimum value of alpha as a function of L. Recall that L was the number of constraints, how many, uh, how much unitarity you impose up to spin L. So of course, the, um, if you impose more constraints, it's harder to minimize, right? You're trying to minimize, you put more constraints, so it's harder. So you see that the function is indeed growing with L, all functions are growing with L. But what we see is that for a fixed ansatz, so N is the number of variables in the ansatz, for a fixed size of ansatz, as you increase the number of constraints, this minimum saturates. Okay? So you have these plateaus. And so we estimate the minimum value by this plateau. And then afterwards, we increase the size of the ansatz. And you see, if we increase the size of the ansatz, then it's easier to make alpha minimum because the ansatz has more freedom, so it can go down. Okay, so the, the extrapolation is done like that. So that's step number four. So we even tried to do some uh, estimate of the error by, so when we extrapolate to infinite spin, um, one has to, uh, what we do is we basically, we fit to inverse powers of spin. We pick different groups of points, okay? So we, we can use that to get a, an error bar. As you see here, there's some error bars. For each value of N, we, we estimate, and then we extrapolate again for large N. And okay, I can tell you the result. If you do that, it looks like the minimum value of alpha that can be attained after these two extrapolations is, uh, well, 0 0.13 plus or minus 0 0.02. Okay, so this is, this is what justifies the title. It seems that uh, string theory seems to cover all, or at least, at least up to our numerical precision, all the available range compatible with the basic principles of uh, the S matrix bootstrap. Okay, so, so this is the summary plot. So you have this axis of alpha, we had this desert and this garden realized by string theory. And now we have our ansatz, which, well, we were able to realize with different sizes of ansatz, all these values of alpha. And then when we extrapolated, we got this band, which is compatible with 0 0.14. Okay. Of course, it would be great to improve our numerics and to actually develop better methods to really check if, if the minimum is the minimum uh, of string theory, but that's the, the state of the art at the moment. Uh, okay, let me give you some comments about the physics. Five minutes, okay, and slightly late, but should be good. So one question you might ask is, how is the sum rule satisfied? So recall that alpha was given by a sum rule, that that's why we knew it was positive. So you can plot now the integrand of the sum rule. And um, 
And here I'm showing you the plot for uh, uh, on Zoom. Hi, um, I have a question. So uh, in string theory, you have a, in type 2a and type 2b, you have a particular uh, minimum that uh, you are trying to match, but you also can realize every value above that. Is yeah. there any meaning for your um, ma matching your ansets and how, what values they get and the other values of a, of alpha that are realized in string theory or shouldn't think at all about any value above the so, minimum? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. So, so I was trying to minimize alpha. So, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get minimal alpha. So I'm going to compare with the minimum alpha that is in string theory. But it's also, I mean, it's clear that um, there is no upper bound. So if we try to maximize alpha, there is no upper, it doesn't convert. We can really, it's easy to realize arbitrarily large alpha also in the S matrix bootstrap context. So that, that's uh, consistent with string theory. Um, did I answer your question? <laughs> you should have come. Hi, can I ask a question? C could you unmute him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't. Yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, no, so. Uh, to ask it uh, in a different way, uh, can you see any features of string theory at not at the minimum point that uh, sort of resembles your approximations? Um, right, so this is what I was going to show now is, so how do you now look for features? So now we, when we get this minimum value of alpha, we get the full amplitude. Okay, because we minimize, so we get all the values of the parameters that actually give this minimum value of alpha. So now we can look at the amplitude and try to understand the physics. Uh, so since for other values of alpha, we do not get any specific amplitude, I cannot compare in other, in other values of alpha. But for the minimum value, I can try to interpret the physics and that's what I was going to try to show you now. For the okay. others, I, I would have to, yeah, you, so in this S-matrix bootstrap, you get an amplitude at the extremum, okay? If you ask any question, you extremize something, and then at that point, you can see what the amplitude is and try to understand the physics. But in the middle of the allowed region, you don't get an amplitude. There's like infinite amount of amplitude, so it's harder to, to ask, answer this question, okay? Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Oh. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, so I want to ask, uh, um, I saw the, uh, this non-holomorphic Einstein theory is three half is a consequence of maximum super symmetry, since you also assume that. Sorry, I, I couldn't understand the question. I was just asking um, if the Eisenstein series is a consequence of supersymmetry. Was that the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. The Eisenstein series is a consequence of supersymmetry. I mean, the after four terms of two D supergravity, the form of the Eisenstein series is the consequence. Isn't it uh, you have to appeal for uh, SL2 in SL2Z? No, it, isn't it more than just type 2 supersymmetry in type B? I think it's not enough. Well, the maximum supersymmetry will give you the differential equations. 
that is satisfied by the non-homomorphic Einstein series. Um, once I fit in the boundary condition, you know, well, boundary condition, roughly speaking, is just uh, the power counting for, you know, G string dependence. Ah, because, right, because you, I see, right, because you, here I'm always thinking that I'm in just a fixed background and G string is a parameter, but you say if we promote G string to a field, then, uh, then supersymmetry also acts on that, that you can. Uh, yeah. Right, but I think this type of supersymmetry will not, yeah, this is not visible in 2 2 scattering, right? Because 2 2 scattering, you are just in a fixed background, fixed G string, and, uh, and the scattering. So this would be relations between multiple amplitudes, right? Because that's you... correct. So to really derive it, one needed to use the supersymmetry at the six point level, right. namely non linearly. But I saw that you're also using unitality, which is the same using six point in some sense. Yeah, that, that's a good question, but, uh, but it falls into this um, major bottleneck of the current S matrix bootstrap is that we really, whenever that, is, I mean, there's a lot of interesting physics associated with uh, I don't know, 223, 224, so more higher point amplitudes, but uh, it's just too hard. We, we don't know how to extract something which is still manageable and useful. So, so that's a good point. If we could use nonlinear supersymmetry to relate different amplitudes and still constrain even more the, the the S matrix. Yeah, I, that's a good point, but I don't know how to do it. Oh, no, no, I was saying people use six points that already derived the, uh, the fact that the, this coefficient is a non holomorphic Einstein series. Yeah, but that's you can do analytic, uh, yeah, and that, but not, uh, not uh, I don't know how to include it into this uh, non perturbative setup numerically. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think Walodi also has a question. Okay. I hope you, you give me some extra time. I give you. I give. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Joao. Uh, I, uh, it's a technical question. Uh, for each, uh, I look at the picture and uh, I know that for each of these ends, you get uh, the precise inequalities from below and from above usually, yes? Uh, because you have uh, less of conditions than uh, of the equations to solve. And so you have a sort of a corridor for each uh, of the sun. But how much, do, uh, I mean, uh, since it's not seen on this picture, uh, for example, what are, what is, um, what are these upper and lower limits, for example, for n and equals 24? I wonder whether they are much bigger than your last uh, value after, uh, after, uh, ah. You, you wanna see here? Yeah, 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 maybe this is a, so uh, you say, uh, you wanna say that with this interpolation, you really uh, uh, you, uh, make it better because, uh, Ah, because I see that this interpolation essentially is uh, in these bounds, in the upper and lower bounds of the last uh, data point, no? That you don't increase much the precision by interpolating. Um, you see this, uh, this green spot is more or less of the same thickness it touches already your limiting uh, limiting value. Ah, you mean, uh, right. What dominates, uh, you're asking what dominates the error. Why do I get this error? It's more or less at the same size. Yeah, that's more or less clear, but I think the, it's more or less, yeah, th that's my worry. It's of the same size as the last spot. Yeah. So. Yeah, that... I mean, actually, yeah. We have a bit more data points now, but we cannot do much better. Yeah, it's, this is. Uh, I actually think that what dominates the error is because you really need to, to extrapolate and so it matters even what's ba back here and you see like there's some point doesn't fall exactly on the curve so that's why mm -hmm. you get some, some error but yeah. 
I think the honest way would be to, to extrapolate uh, separately the upper and the lower limits, yes? Right, I mean here, yeah, these are definitely not rigorous error, error bars. This is just to have an idea. Yeah, yeah. The, the hope is that we can make a method really converse to many digits, but we are not yet there. So we just give you an idea of what the, what the error is. But mm -hmm. not, not just a, for curiosity, what is the, for example, for the last point, what is the number of equations and the number of uh, positivity conditions uh, ooh, approximately? Ooh. Good question. What, what is the ratio? Uh, I mean, it's huge. I think we take like 300. The, the grid in S is like, uh, I, I think about 300 points. And then we are going to spin uh, 240 here. So you can take the product. That's the number of constraints, unitarity constraints. Mm -hmm. And the number of variables is more or less the square of n, so it's like 400 or something uh, number of variables. So it's like yeah. 400 versus 220, or it's more than 220. No, no, no. N. So n squared is the number of variables, approximately. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. But the number of constraints is not just l because it's l times the number of grid points in S. So it's uh, it's more ah. like 240 times 300. It's many more constraints. Many more constraints. Uh, uh -huh. I see. Now I see the order for this of it. Yeah. Okay. Shall I, shall I show you some physics? Sure. <laughs> okay. Let me just show you that, and then you you can ask me more questions afterwards. So there is some physics in the amplitude. So the sum rule already shows you a very nice uh, bump, which is the favorite shape for a, an experimental particle physicist. So this bump is a resonance and it's a, um, it's a scalar resonance because we can actually look at the spin zero phase shift. So this is what I'm plotting here. So this, the phase shift is just defined well, you take this SLs, which was the partial amplitude of spin L, and uh, the exponent is the phase shift. And uh, I'm plotting for you the, the phase shift for spin zero. And you see it crosses pi over two, like a good resonance should do. And we can also estimate the, the width of the resonance. And um, well, here in this picture, you can also understand the difficulty of the numerics because well, if you read what's written here, so the, each gray curve, it's a different value of n. So as you increase n, first there is no resonance, and then suddenly when n goes from 20 to 21, a zero enters the unit disk, and uh, you see this resonance, and then it converges. And the, the difficulty of the numerics is that this phenomena of resonances entering, so resonances are zeros inside this unit disk, and when a zero enters, of course, unitarity is going to be, unitarity means the function should be one at the boundary of the disk. But if a zero enters, or should be, sorry, less than one, but the optimal solution here wants to saturate unitarity. So the optimal solution, when it, a zero enters, cannot saturate unitarity because you have a zero. And then you have to increase n and slowly the mm -hmm. zero stop somewhere inside and unitary gets saturated again. And what we observe is as you increase more n, more and more zeros enter. So it's not only spin zero, there are heavier resonances in spin two. And so we expect that if we really have more power, we would just see more and more resonances coming in. So it would be interesting to understand if this spin zero resonance in particular is the strong coupling version of say the lightest scalar uh, string state, massive string state that, right? At weak coupling, we know that the amplitude, the Vira Zoro Shapiro amplitude has many poles. And now these poles, of course, as you turn on the coupling will become resonances because they become unstable. And maybe this is what remains of, of the lightest one, but. Um, okay, I'm out of time. So I will just show you here ideas for the future, different dimensions. M theory should be 
particularly interesting because alpha in M theory is a number. There is no range, there is no string coupling to move. So can we try to see that the asymmetric bootstrap only allows this number? I honestly think this is very, that would be very surprising from the asymmetric bootstrap perspective that only one value would be allowed. But that's what M theory says. So it, I'm, uh, I'm trying to convince Andrea to run these numerics, but he's busy with more interesting conceptual problems. So. Um, and another point is inelasticity, okay? So another very important point would be to consider inelasticity. And we know something about inelastic processes from particle production, from black hole production, and, uh, and so on. And the last slide, let me still show it to you. I think it's really crucial. And there's been a lot of recent work on that, which is called the dual formulation. So what I told you here today in the language of uh, semi-definite programming is what's called a primal problem where you actually build the solution. So you approach the bound, let's say in this case, you approach the bound by increasing N from above, but there is also a dual problem where you just exclude values of alpha rigorously, and then you approach from below. And so if you have both primal and dual, then you're really in the sweet spot because then you can sandwich the optimal bound and you know when you converge and the error rigorously. So there has been a lot of work in the recent years developing dual problems for asymmetric bootstrap, first in 2D and now more recently in 4D. You heard about it this week by Michael. And uh, it would be very interesting to apply it to this problem, but uh, it's not yet ready for that, hopefully in the, in the near future. And well, there's also a, lo a lot of parallel activity, many, many papers in uh, very related, I, I would also call it a dual formulation, but in a context where only linear unitarity is used. Okay, so the condition that is used in all these works is that the imaginary part of the partial amplitude is positive while we use the full nonlinear condition and why that's why we have to do numerics and they can do many things analytically. And at the moment it's, it's a bit unclear how much do you gain by doing nonlinear because somehow basically we're doing different problems. So I think it would be important that we do some, the same problem systematically to see the effect of nonlinear entirety versus linear entirety. So that's another important question for the future. And uh, sorry for going over time. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, very interesting talk. I, I, I was wondering um, when you reach this alpha minimum, you have that this matrix so absolute value should be equal to one for all VSL. Is that correct? Uh, and if that is the case, uh, I should expect that a process for two to three should uh, be zero. If you make an answer for two to three, substitute your alpha and uh, you get uh, zero processes for the production. What, what, what happens? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So. So first of all, uh, we only impose the inequality, right? That uh, the modulus of each uh, partial amplitude um, is less than one, less or equal to one. So, so in principle, we could get uh, inelastic effects, doesn't have to saturate. In practice, what we get, well, this is a, in a hard numerical problem like this, this is not clean cut, what I'm going to say, but given all the experience we have from different problems, what I think happens is that if you fix the energy and you fix the spin, like whatever, choose spin four energy 10, and then you start increasing your ansatz, uh, larger and larger n, the optimal amplitude will saturate in entirety. So what you will see is that there is always an elastic effect, an elastic part, but somehow this inelastic part is pushed to higher energies and higher speed as you increase the number of variables. So this is quite puzzling, to be honest, because 
if you think about the limit, if you think you have, what if I have infinite computational power? What is going to be the limit? At any edge and any spin, I only have two, two, two. So as you say, two, two, three is not possible. And in particular, black hole production is not possible. And, um, and okay, you, you could say then this is just some amplitude that is compatible with these axioms, but it's not really physical. So that would be one solution, but that's actually not an acceptable solution because, well, not in this context, but in the context of quantum field theory with a mass gap, there are theorems, for example, the work of Axe in some of the 70s, I think, that show that there is a, a lower bound on elastic effect. So if you have, if you have an interacting theory, um, you cannot just have purely elastic S matrix in higher dimensions. Right here, you know very well that you can, but it's in two dimensions, but not in higher dimensions. So somehow uh, this limiting procedure must be very subtle and maybe in the limit, you don't really get some function that this inelastic effect at high energy and high spin becomes some kind of distribution, some kind of strange, uh, there's no good limit of this function, but, but this is really, it's very difficult to answer this question numerically, and I don't think we have a very good idea uh, analytically or theoretically. So th this is the state of the art. Thank you. Okay, now, Kostya has a question on Zoom. Um, um, so, sorry for a very silly question. Um, um, so, the, the parameter alpha, uh, it seems to me, um, in a sense, measures the strengths of interactions. Uh, but but um, uh, somehow it becomes big when interactions are weak. Why, why so? So, uh, good, good question. So often, so it depends. So if it, okay, if it was pions, no, actually, I take it back. So one thing is that even if alpha was zero, the, I'm sorry, I need I need to practice for for politics. This is um, even if alpha is zero here, you already have the the Newton constant. Okay, so so interactions. In fact, we work in units where the Planck length is one. So interactions shut down at low energies, but at energies of order L Planck, you already have interactions just from supergravity. So they are never turned off. So in that sense, uh, you don't need alpha. Um, then uh, what is the interpretation of alpha in terms of coupling? If you compare with string theory, it would be more the opposite that large, very large alpha would correspond to weakly coupled string theory. If, uh, I mean, I can show you again. Um, well, you can see G string goes to zero or, or if you go to the... Um... Uh, this was precisely my question. Why, why weakly coupled string theory predicts very large alpha? Ah, okay, sorry. Good, that's a good question. It has a different answer. It's, it's because we're measuring everything in, uni in Planck units. So if you measure everything in Planck units, like we do here, it's the only natural scale in this non-perturbative setting. What is weakly coupled string theory? It's a strange theory because now it's a theory that has particles which are much lighter than the natural scale, right? Because the string scale is much lighter than the Planck scale at weak coupling. So that's why alpha is so large. It's because alpha at, in weakly coupled string theory is natural scale is the string scale. So, so that's why if you then measure it in uh, Planck units, it, it's a very big number. So you can think of alpha, alpha is an effective, is a higher derivative term. So you can think of it as coming from integrating out massive particles and you will have a big effect if you're integrating out a light particle. And that's what happens in weakly coupled string theory. You have a light particle compared to the Planck scale. So you're in a sense trying to push everything to the Planck scale from the when you're going to the closer to the bound. Yeah, so this this problem mm -hmm. 
uh, yeah, the setup is really tailored to go to the most strongly coupled where where you push all all new particles to the Planck scale. Yeah. 